Hi guys, and welcome back to another Tech Minds video. So I'm pretty sure a lot of you saw my last video on the new NRSPST SDR receiver from SDR Play. Well, that launched on the 27th of November. Now that video generated a lot of interest and a lot of comments and questions. Now at the end of this video, I will answer some of those questions. And if more questions pop up, please feel free to ask them in the comments below and I'll address them as soon as possible. So the NRSPST is the first networked SDR receiver from SDR Play. And with it being networked means we can also use it across the internet. We can either use the SDR Connect application, which is multi-platform, or we can use the inbuilt web server on literally any device which has a modern web browser. So first though, we need to make some configuration settings at the site where the NRSP will be hosted. Wherever you have the NRSP installed, whether it's a remote location in a desert somewhere or at your local ham radio club, or maybe you even have one set up at home so you can dial into it from anywhere in the world, you will need to make some settings on the NRSP's network configuration and your local internet router. Now, personally, I would recommend to connect the ethernet port of the NRSP to your router's ethernet port. However, you can use Wi-Fi and for my testing, Wi-Fi does actually work really well. Now on the network page within the admin tool, whether you're using Ethernet or Wi-Fi, I'd also recommend to configure a static IP address. Essentially, this is assigning a single IP address to the NRSP so that it doesn't change when it's power cycled. Now this is important as the next stage is to open a couple of ports on your internet router. Now all routers admin pages will look a bit different, but the section you're looking for is called port forwarding, or it could be under NAT for network address translation. Now here we need to port forward ports 50,000 and port 9001, and that needs to be forwarded to the static IP address of your NRSP. Now some routers can use network names, which means a static IP address is not really required. But for this example, we can see that the server IP address or essentially the destination IP address is the same as the NRSP static IP address that we set using the admin tool. Now, some routers also need a reboot for these new firewall or port forwarding rules to take effect. So just bear that in mind when you're setting this up. Now, port 50,000 is for the IQ data, which feeds the SDR Connect application, while port 9001 is for when using the web SDR Connect client, and that's where you use a web browser to access the NRSP. Now on the admin tool, there's also an option to specify users and assign a password. Now this means when someone attempts to connect to the NRSP over the internet, they'll be prompted to enter a username and password. Now if you do not have any users listed here, then no users will be prompted and it will be open to anyone that knows the IP address and port number of your device. And when it comes to connecting to this remote NRSP installation, you'll need to know the external or WAN IP address of your internet router, as this will be the IP address that we need to enter into the client side when using SDR Connect on another internet connection. Well, that could be pretty much anywhere in the world. So now we have the server set up, we can move on to the client. So if you're using SDR Connect application, then click the three little dots up here on the right and select remote devices. Add a new one, give it a name and enter the external IP address of the internet router that we got from the server site. Make sure the NRSPST is enabled and then enter a username and password if you set up users on the server. Then just click save changes. On the top left of the SDR Connect screen, tap the refresh button just wait a few seconds and then open that device list. Now your newly added remote server should be listed there. Now assuming all the IQ modes are set up on the server, you can choose between light, compact and full, and then just press the play button to connect to that server. Now here I am connecting to a friend's remote server halfway up the country from me. And well, this is how it performs. Now I'd like to quickly thank today's video sponsor, and that's JLC PCB. Now, if you do not know who JLC PCB is, well, they're a one-stop shop for everything related to PCB manufacturing at a fraction of the cost compared to others. They're affordable and provide a fast and high quality service. 
JLC PCB can manufacture one to eight layer PCBs, and with a fast lead time of up to just 24 hours, their strict quality control is trusted by over 5.4 million customers around the world. Now, JLC PCB has an in house production guaranteeing consistent quality for prototypes and large orders. The ordering process is super easy with instant quotes and a very user friendly platform, which includes real time tracking of your order. JLC PCB have some great money saving Black Friday coupons available on the website running through to the 15th of December. So if you want to save some money on your next PCB, then head to the link in the video description. Very, very good. Okay, uh, so you're you're in Man. How far are you away from the city centre, over? Uh, four miles northeast. All oh, right. Um, I don't know. I don't know Manchester. Sorry. So I've still got. So it's still working. Anyway, I'd actually, it's um, it's very interesting, Rob. Actually, having the radio because it's you don't realise it, but we the amateur radio has made raw, really. Uh, it's all right for occasional use, but if you're going to plug things in and out regularly, sooner or later that would fail, I think. It would be much better if it was uh, fixed to the chassis rather than uh, just the ball. Yes, I'm just outside of Trigger on here. It was about a minus three year last night, so maybe a little bit more done. Now that was using full IQ, and in my opinion, that's pretty impressive. There's no stutters or glitching, and SDR Connect seemed to perform as if the NRSP was actually physically connected to my local computer. So what's it like connecting to the same NRSP across the internet, but using a web browser? So using Google Chrome, and obviously here I do not want to expose my friend's external IP address or domain, but this is where you would type that external IP address and make sure to include the 9001 port number. I think it's about 80 miles from here, over. Yeah, you're going across country, it's a bit of a, uh, yeah, going through Stoke, it can be, uh, the roads, uh, because the missus was in hospital once in Stoke, going back, and uh, it was a hell of a journey to go and see her from, from here. Um, yeah, yeah. I was listening to John there, and I couldn't remember his call sign, and it didn't come up until the end. <laughs> I know the voice, but I just couldn't put a picture of call sound. So the web interface just looks almost identical to the SDR Connect application that runs on your computer. However, there are some differences. Now, I won't go into these specific differences at the moment in this video because this is actively being developed, meaning these features could change or even new ones added, which would make this video kind of redundant. So for those interested in decoding digital data remotely, like FTA, SSTV, and even weather faxes transmitted from NOAA satellites, this is still very much possible. If you're using a computer and the SDR Connect application, then things become a little easier because we can still use applications like virtual audio cable to route the audio from SDR Connect to third-party software decoders. In fact, when you're using SDR Connect with a remote server, it's as if the NRSP is connected locally, directly to the computer. So all of those third-party applications that you'd have used before will still work, and you just need to route the received audio as you normally would. As mentioned at the start of the video, you guys asked lots of questions on my last video on this product. Now, after speaking directly with the SDR Play team, I can answer some of those questions. So the popular question was, how many simultaneous users are supported? Well, there's no fixed answer to this because it really depends on how the NRSP is being used. The connection mode, signal bandwidth, and signal type all play a massive part in performance for multiple users. 
Now, a lot of work has been done to balance the signal processing that is performed on the GPU and the CPU, and that maximizes the available processing power. Now, you can pause the video and read the text on this slide here for more detail, but essentially with lower bandwidth signals such as AM or SSB, the limit is a lot greater and can maybe support up to eight users. So why does the NRSP use a 24 megahertz external reference and not a standard 10 megahertz that we see on a lot of other equipment? Well, simply put, this is just determined by the chipset which is used. Another question that was asked was about the power supply and if it was tested for any noise emissions. Well, the answer to that again is yes. A lot of work was undertaken to find a power supply that was quiet, met emission standards, and did not cause undesirable spurious interference on the NRSPST itself. So you can rest assured that the power supply that comes with it is of good quality. Another popular question was, are there any plans to develop built-in data decoders or support plugins from third party developers. So, currently, there's no plans to have inbuilt decoders, but it's something which has not been ruled out or ruled in. Modules or plugin development will be available on SDR Connect once the module API has been published by SDR Play. So, that's great for third party developers and, of course, end users. Now, third party plugins will not be allowed to run directly on the NRSP in firmware and obviously that's down to security and software stability priority obviously we don't want third-party plugins causing any detrimental problems to the actual base firmware now could there be a potential issue with data corruption in the event of a power cut or just pulling the plug out well the nrsp uses a custom lightweight linux os and it operates almost completely in a read-only file system now, the single exception to this is when any configuration changes are being saved. Now, during normal operation, absolutely zero information is being written to the flash, so powering off should never be an issue. However, there is some really strong backup and restore utilities available within the admin page. Now, one thing I didn't mention in my last video, and surprisingly, no one commented about, and that's the cooling and heat generated from the NRSP while it's in use. Now you may have noticed there was no fans inside or on the external of the case. And that's because significant efforts were made in the design so that the NRSP runs cool and does not require any of these noisy or unreliable fans to keep it cool. Now the last popular question, and this was even asked before it was released, and that's why it was PoE, i.e. power over ethernet, not included. Well, there's two main reasons for this. The first is cost, and the second is having the components to support the PoE inside a case of a sensitive radio receiver could potentially generate interference. Now, the cost of adding your own external PoE both saves money to the end user and eliminates any noise that's within the case. So I think that's an extremely valid reason. Another thing you have to think about is not everybody's going to want to use PoE. So adding that extra cost for everybody would kind of seem a bit unfair. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. And I know this has probably generated more questions, but if you want to see anything tested specifically, then let me know down in the comments below. Now, I know I haven't covered everything that was asked in the last video, but I will get to those eventually. Until the next video, take care of yourselves. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.